Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. The hair is so lovely. Pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the Band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 232 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Lee Jennings from The Funeral Portrait, I want to let you know that the Mistress Carrie Grunge Brunch this Saturday, November 16th at City Winery Boston is sold out. Featuring music from Rotten Apple performing Alice in Chains Unplugged set, this first grunge brunch sold out fast, but you can keep your eyes on the concert calendar at mistresscarry.com because there are more events getting scheduled all the time. My guest this week is Lee Jennings from The Funeral Portrait, who this week found out their first radio song is also their first number one rock song. The band celebrating the success of their song Suffocate City featuring longtime friend Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills. I talked to Lee about unseating Linkin Park after six weeks on top of the rock chart. We talked about the band's influences, songwriting, and big plans for 2025. So allow me to introduce you to Lee Jennings from The Funeral Portrait. Hi, Lee. Thanks for coming on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Am I one of the first to be able to say congratulations on your number one song? Yes, yes. I think uh, besides maybe my mom, you are the first. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot to unseat a new Linkin Park song after six weeks, and your collaboration with Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills finally figured out how to do it. <laughs> Isn't that wild? I... Uh... I never thought that one Linkin Park would come back, and I'm so hyped that they did. So I'm I'm in love with all these new songs. I think they are rushing, and the live shows look insane. And then number two, to be the band to uh, I guess dethrone them. Yeah, after six weeks. I mean, look, they had a good run. They definitely did. They definitely did. I mean, look, you're you're a singer, so you can kind of see it from both sides. The idea of having to replace like Chester, yeah. Yes. No, I know. <laughs> I know me too. But that's, I mean, think about it. That was a thing, you know, one day. And it's like, I think about that all the time is I don't know how she's doing it because me mentally, I could not deal with it. You know, and I, there's so much, it's so cool because I see a lot of positivity about all of her and how great she is. And I remember when we were actually traveling, we were in, on the five finger death punch tour and we were in the RV and we all got the notification, hey, this thing's going live now. Tune in. We literally put it on the RV like speakers and turned it up and we watched the whole thing, listened to the whole thing. And she was crushing it. It was so cool to see live and like it like happened right before our eyes. I mean, I think it's a good thing. One, that they took the time they did since Chester passed away. And two, you know, it's impossible for her to replace him. Yeah. So she does get that grace and leeway that <laughs> the band is just in a new era. Yeah, which is cool because you can tell with the songs, you know, that it is new, but it still sounds like Linga Park. You know, the, the, the riffs, the, the songwriting is very similar but it's not fully the same band, which is that's what you want, you know, when you do something like that. It's an unenviable task, and 
you know, the the examples where it's been done successfully, you can kind of count on one hand, right? When you look at like an ACDC or a Van Halen in a different situation where you try to replace an iconic front man. And it's especially when you've achieved the levels of success, it's impossible for her to try and compete with that or replicate it. So I guess just not even trying, there's yeah. got to be something so, freeing about that. Yeah. Well, and it's cool because like, I, I think it's, it's cool that they're able to do it because again, I think, you know, uh, growing up, you know, I think one of my first looks at it was, you know, a band like Blink-182 did it, you know, when they brought in uh, Matt Skiba, you know, and it was fun. It was cool. It was different. But I think there was still that missing part. And I think a lot of people felt that way, you know, and, and I love Outline Trio. I grew up on Outline Trio. I love Matt Skiba. But like, you know, as soon as Tom DeLonge came back, everybody's like, oh, my God. And that's why, I mean, they're selling out, you know, arenas and maybe next year stadiums or whatever they're going to do next, you know? And it's just like, that's, that's just like Lincoln Park. You know, I, I think those songs are so special to so many people that, you know, I'm glad that they took the time to find the right person to, to really do it. I think she's crushing it. It's hard to imagine, but there's a whole generation of Lincoln Park fans that never saw the band live. Yes. And I mean, look at what three days grace is doing, bringing Adam back, but then having Will still be in the band, there's yeah. a whole generation of Three Days Grace fans that have never seen Adam sing with the band before. It's crazy. I know. It's so weird to think about because I remember I saw Lincoln Park. Um, I, I think I saw them in 2004. And then I was really lucky. Sorry, we are going over the craziest bumps I've ever experienced. I can't hear it. Before. That was crazy. Oh, well, I love that. I'm just watching um, you bump up and down, but I can't hear oh, the noise. Okay, good. Then you can you can envision it. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I remember I saw Lincoln Park in like maybe 2004. Um, and then I got to see them again in 2007, maybe that was, on the Project Revolution tour with My Chemical Romance. And that that lineup was insane. It was it was. Lincoln Park, Mike Kim, like him, Mindless Self-Indulgence, Placebo. Um, I can't even remember who else was like, I think Taking Back Sunday maybe was on it. It was crazy. It was such a cool lineup. And I remember watching Lincoln Park right after Michael Booker Romance. And I was like, this is the pinnacle of, of cool shows. Like it didn't get any better, you know? And and, and it's, it's cool to see music that I grew up loving kids you know that uh, when i was that age you know getting to experience for the first time where maybe they never thought they would so it's cool that they did it i i think it's so cool i mean it's the same kind of thing that zach wilde says about pantera opening up for metallica there's a whole generation of metal fans that never got to see those songs performed live before and it'll never be the same without vinnie and dime but the opportunity to hear walk in a stadium, I mean, there's something about that. Yeah, I mean, we just saw them uh, at Aftershock. And I remember, um, so I was really not, you know, it's funny. I was never really into Pantera, um, but my guys in my band loved that band, right? And they grew up and they never got to see them, right? So them experiencing getting to see Pantera for the first time was such a magical experience. Like I, I saw them all like losing their minds, you know, and then, a, you know, a few hours later, it was the same deal with watching Slayer, you know, and, it, and it's so cool to getting to experience these legacy acts, even if they are a little different. Um, it, it still is very reminiscent, you know, and, and they do a great job at honoring. Um, you know, I haven't seen Lincoln Park yet. We get to play with them at Sonic Temple uh, next year. And uh, that'll be my first time seeing this version. And I'm sure they do the same thing. I'm sure there is definitely moments where they honor, you know, Chester and, and, and they, they figure it out. You know, I think it's going to be cool. It's one of those things where I think in a lot of ways it sets rock apart. Because rock fans have been lulled into this sense of, 
well, if I don't catch the band this time, I can just catch them next time. I mean, hell, the Rolling Stones just toured stadiums and just got nominated for a Grammy, and they're in their 80s. We're so spoiled that our favorite bands are always going to be there. And I tell people all the time, go see the bands you've always wanted to see before that chance gets taken away from you. Like, buy the concert tickets. Go see the bands that you want to see. Yeah. No, completely. I think it's one of those things, too, that, like, I think as a rock fan, we... We are spoiled, right? Because bands tour a lot more than pop artists or hip hop artists or whatever it may be, you know? So it's cool that we get to experience our favorite band maybe two, three times a year, right? And that is slowly changing. I'm seeing that more now. There's bands that are only doing festivals every year, you know, and then the next year they'll go on a tour, you know? But very rarely, especially up and coming bands like us, I mean, we, we hit markets two, three times a year because that's what we know, you know, that's how we do this. It's how we grind. That's what, what it's about. I think rock is still so much about a live show. And that's so important. I mean, you look at some of these artists that we really look up to like ghosts or even ice nine or, you know, what, you know, Rob zombie or whatever. I love those bands and I listen to those bands, but going to see their show, I enjoy more because it's an experience. It's not, you know, it's almost like a theater play. You know, it's it than it is or a musical than it is watching a band play. And, you know, us, even us as a band, that's what we're trying to kind of do. Well, rock bands don't get the same opportunities that pop artists do, right? They don't give out our Grammys live on TV. I know. So in order, for, with, in order for bands to really be able to find their audience, you know, you got to press the flesh. You got to get out there and open up for bands in front of 30 people and nobody cares that you're on the stage and you got to plug away and you guys have been doing that for a while now and then you wake up this morning to a number one song. I know, I know. That was, see, that is what is insane right now is so much has changed for us so fast and um, it's really cool. Uh because I feel like we've also been working for 10 years for this moment, right? So it's it's a little different than, you know, us, quote, having maybe a viral sound on TikTok or whatever it is that we just started or whatever it is, you know, and then, or, or you know, this is our, you know, we've been a band, we've been a band for 10 years, right? We've been playing to 30 people every night. Now, you know, especially after this Five Finger tour that we did, like, you know, we'll go play these same places because we, I mean, we're basically haven't been home since that tour and we just like announce more dates and just keep announcing more dates and every time that we come back to these markets it's just been growing and you know we we just sold out our hometown show to 620 tickets like that that i when our agent was like oh that's the only room available i was like oh no it's gonna be we're gonna play to you know 200 people maybe right and then it's like first day on sale we sell 200 tickets and i'm like Oh, like this is a thing that. Yeah, the world has changed for you now. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's You're crazy. that decade in the making overnight success. Yes. Well, the, I'm sure we'll still get those comments of, uh, you know, uh, industry plants, you know, all of those, those great ones. Overnight success, sure. So. Yeah, no, no problem. We've just been doing it forever, opening up for every band that'll take us on tour I haven't seen my mom in, you know, four years, but you're right. It's an overnight success. You're right. You're right. Exactly. And it's cool though, because, you know, we have been able to build such a core, strong fan base. And like I said, this Atlanta show, we've got people from Germany for this show because they, they've seen that, that, you know, they want to experience it. They want to be, we're doing like a live DVD. We're doing like everything. We're going all out. They want to be in it. And they're all over the country because that's that fan base that we've built, you know, and you can't get that fan base doing it in one year, you know what I mean? Or one big tour. You don't just get that, right? You get that from the years and the years of playing to those 15 people or 50 people or whatever it is. Well, there's something to be said 
for seeing your favorite band in their hometown too. Those hometown shows always hit a little different. Yes, completely. I mean, it's it's funny because I think I I wonder why though. You know, I, that is a really funny thing. I think it's just uh, it's you know, I guess it's like a sports team too. You know, it's you know, it's the hometown crowd. Everybody wants to root for you. You know. Um, but it's funny though, because I've always heard in, in, especially in rock, like sometimes your hometown hates you the most too. Uh, because I think a lot of people, oh, I knew them before they were big or whatever it is. But for us, it's been the opposite. You know, it's, it's been this thing of celebration. You know, I think people, like you said, I think that's another thing too, is people want to be there to celebrate with us, especially, you know, waking up this morning, having a number one and all these things. It's like tickets, you know we sold the last like 50 tickets this morning, you know, after our little post about it, you know? So it's, it's cool to see it all happening right in front of our eyes. It's funny that you compare it to sports. Are we allowed to talk about sports at all? You're an Atlanta guy. I'm up in new England. It, have we gone past the soreness or are we allowed to talk? Yet? Yeah. So I don't really do sports. <laughs> I, do, I, I like baseball. Um, and the only reason why I like baseball is because like, we had uh, the Braves, you know, the Atlanta Braves during like the the nineties era of the Atlanta Braves and stuff like that. And, you know, just recently we did win the world series as well. But I think, you know, I think baseball in Atlanta has always been kind of a thing, you know, and we had the Olympics um, in the nineties and I'm, I'm a little older uh, than some people. And uh, I remember them. I was in kindergarten, but I still remember them. Um, and I was very lucky to go to a few games where we did baseball. We did, my grandmother was huge into tennis. So we got to see like Andre Agassi play, which was in the nineties was like a celebrity, you know, he was like a celebrity. So that was really huge. Um, you know, and I think for us, I think, I think Atlanta, it's a big sports, but I think, uh, you know, football is huge here. That was a big thing growing up. Everybody wanted me to play football. Uh, Cause I'm a big dude. I'm six foot four. Um, you know, I was, I was just big my whole life and I was like, no, I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in it. I played, played literally like once, you know, and I was like, nope, not for me. You know, I did the musical theater rap. That was my world. And everybody was so confused because I had the perfect body, you know, to be a sports guy. And, uh, I was the complete opposite of that. Well, that's why I was asking because of, of football with the, you know, with the with the Patriots comeback, oh, yes. I'm oh, friends yes. with the guys from Seven Dust, and trust me, there was a lot of texting back and forth during yes. that game. That game, oh yes, that game was a lot. <laughs> oh, I remember. <laughs> when it comes to you growing up, looking like a football player, but wanting to be in musical theater. I have a theory about music and like the phases of your musical identity that when you're a kid, you get exposed to whatever's around. You know, the cool uncle, your older siblings, your parents, and whatever they're listening to is the soundtrack to your childhood. And then you wake up one day and you hear a band, a song, something, and you go, I like that. So while you were developing this love of musical theater as a kid, what was the soundtrack to your childhood? And then what was it that you decided you loved yourself? Yeah. So my mom was huge into, of course, anything 80s, right? Uh, but she she was always at concerts when I, not really when I was younger, because she was a really good mom, but before I was born, she was always at concerts all the time, from local gigs to whatever it was. She had seen, you know, she had seen Blondie to 50 people. You know what I mean? She got to see the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, you know, the, the one time they toured or whatever, you know? And it's like one of these things of like, she got to see a lot of that stuff firsthand. So hearing her stories about that. And then, um, you know, my grandfather was huge in like Johnny Cash and stuff like that. I, I think for me, my wake up moment, though, was hearing Evanescence on the radio. So my mom had it on uh, 99X, which here in Atlanta is like the, the legacy you know, alt station, rock station. And that's what I grew up listening to. And they played Evanescence. And that was like, I remember them being like, fresh, new rock, Evanescence, you know? And I listened and I fell in love with Amy Lee's voice because I felt like she was 
like classically trained. She had such pretty vo- vocals for a rock band. And for me, being in love with bands like Queen and stuff like that from my mom, um, you know, it was one of those moments of being like, wow, like you can sing like that, but being a rock band, like I, I had no idea that existed. And so Evanescence was definitely that band that just turned me on. And I went to, uh, I remember we went to media play that Friday afterwards, after I got out of school and I went and bought that record, bought the first record and I nonstop listened to it, you know, and then I got to experience it live a few months later. She came to town. Was that your first show? Yes, it was Evanescence and it was at the Tabernacle, which is kind of like our house of blues. Um, and it was the Nintendo Fusion Tour. Um, I remember I didn't really care about any of the other bands because I was also huge into video games. And during that tour, they would bring video games that weren't out yet. And you could go test them like while bands were playing and stuff outside. And <laughs> I remember I did that until Evanescence went on. And that was just such a huge moment for me. Uh, that's how I discovered music was, was kind of through video games. But kind of through uh the radio that's why it's also so important to me that that's how i got into music was the radio and it's so cool that we are on the radio and that we have a number one and and it's it's doing so well because maybe 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 you know there's kids out there that are dealing with the same stuff you know or trying to find their band or their sound and their parents are listening to the radio and they hear us like a younger, more fresh band than the typical stuff that is on most of the radio stations. Well, it's also, you know, to go back to looking at rock as an audience, it's also this multi generational thing now. You know, you've been talking about touring with Five Finger Death Punch. If a guy brings his kid to see Five Finger Death Punch, but his kid loves the funeral portrait, and now they're watching you guys together. I talk to the bands all the time about looking out and seeing multi-generational metalheads together. And what I love, and I saw it at the Metallica tour, was watching metalhead moms with their kids. And like watching them have this bonding experience together. And I was like, yes! Yes, well, that's what I want. And that's, you know, again, my mom went with me to that show because I was young, you know, I wasn't going to go by myself. I also didn't really have any friends that was into music. So it was my mom and I going to that show together. And I just remember experiencing that. And, and, you know, Evanescence is still to this day, one of those bands that I can put on or my mom requests me to put on, on a car drive or anything, you know, and it's, it's one of those things that that's so cool because on five finger, that was, that's, I saw that every night, you know, I got to go, I went out and I met so many people. Cause I was like, as soon as we're done playing, I'll be right over there. I'll point to a place. I'll be there the rest of the night Come and so many families. I met so many families and they're like, Oh, this is my son's first concert. Or he heard your song on the radio and he loves you. And like you said, I love five finger or, you know, we, we love five finger together and we're here, you know, and it's, and it's so cool to see that in real life. And it's cool to see that, that, families can enjoy our music because that's what I, I want, you know, because I remember again, growing up and having those bands with my mom, you know, and being able to play them in the car and her to enjoy it just as much as me. You talk about hometown shows when that Metallica tour came through because ice nine kills is a local band for me. Yes. I had a, a lot of time to sit down with Spencer And talk about that idea of, you know, opening up for a band he went and saw with his dad growing up. And now to be able to open up for Metallica, hometown show, the whole thing. And one of the things that Spencer and I spent a lot of time talking about was you guys being involved with Silver Scream Con and then asking him to be part of Suffocate City and what an honor it was for him. So can you talk to me about your side of getting him on the song? Yeah. So, okay. So last year, um, he invited us to open the uh, Silver Scream Con concert, right? And we 
were trying to take full advantage of it. And so we did like a free meet and greet at the con the day before. And I expected again, maybe a line of maybe 50 people, 30 people, you know, 20, 10, whatever it was. We didn't prepare too much. We were giving away free posters, signing them, whatever. All of a sudden, it turned into a two-hour long line. And I was like, oh, we might be have found our, you know, our niche of fan, you know, or, or people that might enjoy us as well. So then the next day, we go play the con. And, and I always go out to the merch table as soon as we're done playing to uh, meet people. And I, I mean, even at that time, I was selling our merch. We didn't even have a merch person a year ago. So I was selling the merch, meeting everybody, doing all this stuff. And that line didn't end. Even, even went into uh, even went into uh, Ice Nine Kills at set. Like people were still in line to talk to me and to buy merch from me while Spencer was on stage. So I was very, I was very surprised. Um, and then, you know, after the show, he, Spencer came up to me and he's like, yo, what is that song that you guys played? And he, he said it was second to last song. And I was like, oh, that's Suffolk City. He was like, yo, there's something special about that one. And I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, I like it. It's cool. And I, he was like, can you send it to me? So I sent it to him. And then he was like, he, he a little bit went by. And it, got, it kind of was one of those moments of just being like, do you want to feature on it? And he was so down. And he's been so cool about the whole thing. And he did that. And then uh, all of a sudden, a uh, Early this year, I flew out to L.A. and I uh, shot the second half of the video with them in person. And then we came then I flew back to Atlanta and we filmed the first half of the video. And we kind of put them together and things started going extremely well. Uh, and he invited us back out to Silver Scream Con this year. And instead of playing like a full band set, he had us play uh, a, their VIP meet and greet or their VIP party that they kind of have. It's not like really a mean greet, but a VIP party. And that was super fun because uh, we got to play acoustic. And that was our first time ever playing acoustic. And it was one of those moments of we step out on stage, we start singing these songs, and the whole crowd is singing along, like a room full of 500 people. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. This is It's one of those other moments being like, oh, this is something. And we had um, a meet and greet that evening and, and it, it just, the line didn't stop. We had like one of the longest lines of anybody there. And it, it was just these moments. And that's all because Spencer took a chance on us and kind of passed the torch a little bit. You know, I think that's so important, especially in rock music um, is these features and passing the torch. Because if, if you're not careful, I mean, this is all just going to go away you know, rock music will quote die, you know, it'll never really die, but you know, and it's, it's cool to see artists like Spencer take a chance on a small band like us. Well, it's something that hip hop and pop music have done for years, features, collabs, and it's helped to bring up all the artists in the genre and rock would do it every once in a while, but definitely over like the last 10 years, it's really been this thing that is, I mean, I remember when Chris Cornell was, was you know, featured on a Zach Brown band song and everybody was like, yeah. what the hell is going on? But now you see the collabs are so more, they're, they're so much more common. Yep. And so many of them get to the top of the charts because of it, you guys included. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's kind of, I think what it is, you take the power of two bands audiences, right? Um, and I think people just like that. I think people like to have everybody be friends. You know, I think it's part of it, you know? And I think one of, you know, one of my favorite ones this year was the one Jelly Roll did with, you know, Ronnie Radke, you know? I, I, I think, you know, or Falling Reverse, you know, I, I think that was so unique and so fun, you know? And I, and I think having someone like Jelly, you know, I think he just he has such a unique sound and now it doesn't matter about the genre. I think that's a big thing. I think genre bending or, or not even having a genre, it, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, uh, 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 for us, that's why like on our record, you listen to it. We have like an indie rock song straight into like a metal core song straight into like a piano ballad. You know, it's like, what, what, you know, 
uh, maybe 10 years ago that didn't really exist. But nowadays doing these cross genre features is so cool and so unique. Well, that Jelly Roll Falling in Reverse collaboration was number one for five weeks. And then Linkin Park bumped them out of the biggest song of the year and was number one for six weeks. And then you guys came and knocked them out of the number one spot today. <laughs> I can't. That's I still every time you say that, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still very. Uh, that's why I keep I, saying I, it. It is a big deal. Yes. Because this is yes. your first number one song, right? Well, this is well, this is our first time at radio altogether. And that was a big thing. I I, I read an article, someone sent me an article yesterday about our song and, and, and you know what it's doing. And I guess we are like the second band ever to have a number one the first time at radio or whatever. And it's like I think Jelly Roll was the only other one or something. And I'm just like like I, I'm I don't even know what to say, you know, and and it's cool. It's it's just so cool. And it's been so cool to have met so many awesome um people that work for stations, you know, for radio stations that come up to us. And we've been doing these like radio shows or or I've been visiting them and they've just been like, it's a the, the reason why we are playing you so much is because you are a breath of fresh air, you know, and, and it's something new, it's something unique. You guys stand for something, you know, like you guys are willing to do anything. You guys are grinding. You guys are doing it. And it's so funny because to me, I, I don't know, this is just who we are, you know, and, and it's cool to be, I guess I didn't have to change. I think my whole life, I always thought that I needed to change or be someone different to quote, make it. And I never did, you know, we never did as a band. We just released us and we are just us. I'm so bummed I have passed you guys like ships in the night. I was at Silver Scream Con last year and this year, and I was at my booth, which is why I couldn't come see you guys because I had my own booth there. Yes. And I was so bummed. I was like, oh. And then you guys played the Palladium in Worcester not too long ago. And I was yes, at a different did. show that same night and couldn't go. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? When am I going to get to go and say hi to these guys? This is ridiculous. Well, that, that just will make it be a lot more special then because <laughs> it, it, it will be finally meant to be. Yeah. The next time you come around, which, you know, based on how often you guys tour will be like next week. And <laughs> yes, basically you'll wait, just wait until the next dates, I guess. Yeah. So, so tell me about that now, actually, because we're getting to the end of the year. So there's holiday shows. You're obviously doing your big hometown show in Atlanta and then a lot of bands try to take a little downtime to spend time with the families that never get to see you. And you've got to already yes. be laying out plans. I know you've got a bunch of festival dates scheduled for next year. What's 2025 look like for for you guys right now? So we're going to start the year off by starting in the studio, writing new music for another record. Um, we don't want to wait. We waited like, five years work on this record and we don't want to do that we want the next one to come out sooner than later so we're going to start writing that's the first thing and then we go right on on tour we're doing that like a like a club tour with this thing called catch your breath um we're going out with them and they they blew up because of tiktok and it was such a cool moment that they had and they invited us out so we were like sure it's a short one it's like about a month and then right after that we i i think we're just going to go right back on another tour and then we're going to play all the festivals and we're going to go do it's just nonstop next year. And then we're hoping to end the year off by doing, of course, this another like this Halloween -y holiday show, like what we're doing right now. And then um, maybe I finally give ourselves a full on headliner uh, so that way we can perform, you know, more than just five songs uh you know or six songs so we can give everybody maybe perform the record in full and then start you know maybe releasing new music so you think you'll have new stuff out like maybe by the end of next year that's you just had this flip. look of fear <laughs> like i pointed a gun at you and you were like oh my player. god don't make me I answer that i want to i think we want to because again like i said we we've we've waited like five years on this record right 
But at the same time, I want to make sure this record gets um, its its time in the spotlight. So we'll see what happens next, you know, and uh, we're just going to hope for the best. You've been spending so much time out on the road, and I think, you know, for a, for an up-and-coming rock band, touring is not the wanted dead or alive video that people think it is a lot of the time, right? This big glamorous, yep. easy kind of thing. So when it comes to touring, you're in the bus with the guys in the band all the time. What movies get watched constantly and what movies are getting quoted constantly in the bus right now? That's, that's a great question. I'm trying to even think. So we, so we, before the five finger tour, we bought ourselves an RV, which is great. Normally we were in a sprinter van and it was disgusting <laughs> and that we packed it to the brim. Of You're people. not a rock band unless you've traveled in a van. Exactly. Exactly. We did that for 10 years. So I had that van for 10 years. It broke down multiple times, including this time in Billings, Montana. And that was a, that was a whole experience. Um, and you know, I think right now we, we've been keeping a little bit more to ourselves. Uh, we do like to have movie time where we go, we'll go to a theater. Um, we saw the new, uh, Terrifier movie, you of know, course. where they, uh, they play ice line kills in it a little bit, you know, in the dorm room scene. So that was really cool to hear. Um, you know, and I think for us, we play a lot of magic, the gathering cards, uh, you know, the card game. Uh, that's our new thing. We started that on the five finger tour and it is a everyday activity. It's just so much fun, great competition between all of us. And that's more what we spend our time doing. What's the go-to thing when you stop in the middle of the night to fuel up the RV, the truck stop fair, what are you going in hunting for? Because Hot for dogs. people, <laughs> because, Hot dogs, always. because people that have not gone on long road trips, don't understand how amazing those big truck stops are in the middle of the night and what you can can get there. Yes, they can be incredible. But uh, I'm being honest, we're all uh, we love our, uh, you know, our Coca-Cola Zero or the, you know, the Coke Zero. And we all definitely love some hot dogs. (laughs) So those are those are the two things that we always go for. What's the weirdest thing you guys have bought in one of those big truck stops? And I'll tell you that I ask all the bands this question, and so far, Justin Chancellor from Tool wins because his wife bought him a full working suit of armor at a truck stop in America, and he still has it. (laughs) That was probably at the world's largest truck stop. I've seen they sell that there. Um, I'm trying to think, what is something crazy that, I don't know, we've we've definitely bought some funny T-shirts, you know, one that says, like, saucy bossy and a little something i don't know we've we've bought some like dumb t-shirts before um trying to think of i well i have i i I have a a, an addiction to uh stuffed animals sometimes little cute guys so um so i'm trying to think literally i have one i have like one right here this little guy (laughs) this little bear so yeah i mean it's one of those things that it's it's like so anytime that there's something cute like that and i'm bored I'll just get something like that. I don't get to ask guys this question all the time, but the girls that I have on the show, you know, I uh, Ash Costello and I had a pretty extensive conversation because we dye our hair. And yes. having to do that on the road, for Ash, she leaves behind what looks like a crime scene in hotel rooms when she dyes her hair. Yours is a little bit different. It looks like probably Gatorade exploded all over the yeah, tub when green- you got... Yeah, green slime, as we call it. Uh, yeah, so, but I, to be real, this is how I get away with it. I don't really dye my hair on tour. I just did it because we were home for the night. So I did it at my own house. Normally, here's the secret. You don't wash your hair. You wash your body. You just don't wash your hair. You just use dry shampoo. And it normally will stay for most of the tour because um, I'm definitely scared of getting it all over the place. Um, I've definitely done it in a few planet fitnesses, you know, where we go to shower. Um, that's always funny having a guy come in and you're in the, you're in the sink rinsing your hair, you know, and there's just green everywhere. So the life of a touring rock band, you got to do what you got to do. Exactly. Well, I'm so excited for you guys watching this song. 
just climb the chart and to have so many people rooting for you guys and to have Spencer out there singing your praises and talking about how good this song is for you guys to wake up this morning. I'm going to say it again with the number one rock song in the country. Insane. Pretty badass. Insane. Insane. Well, thank you. This has been insane. I mean, it's so cool to just even think about it and and we're just hyped to be here we're excited to keep going that's i think the most fun thing is like hey i'm i'm still i think that's it too is yeah i woke up with the number one rock song but i'm still me you know and, and we still get to do this and we're gonna keep doing it oh you know, next year is bigger and better i think that's what it is you know maybe maybe next year we'll have another number one who knows well you guys have kicked the door down so now it's just a matter of keeping somebody else from putting a door back up Exactly. And we're definitely not uh, letting that door go back up. So. Well, it was so good to finally meet you. I'm sorry I missed you at Silver Scream Con. Well, it's okay. Maybe uh, maybe next year. Maybe next year for sure. Congratulations. Tell the guys I said Thank congratulations. You. I will. There he is, Lee Jennings from The Funeral Portrait, the band's latest album, Greetings from Suffocate City is available now. You can check out their number one rock song, Suffocate City, featuring Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills on this episode's corresponding playlist. I make a playlist for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast that features all of my guest music and all the artists and songs we talked about in the interview. You'll find it linked in the show notes of this episode. You'll also find all the links for The Funeral Portrait and Lee Jennings and you'll find the Mistress Carrie links too. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and share the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, every weekday, you get the sit rep. The Situation Report gives you all of your rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates in about five minutes. And you never know when we're going to release a bonus episode. Join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern, for my weekly streaming video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And you can always find me on the radio. Get the details on all of that and more at mistresscarry.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. <laughs>